guests. Um, so this is being recorded. You should have just gotten a notification about that. Welcome everyone, this is Rethinking Content and the topic for today is reducing readings. Our next session on this topic is going to be on utilizing multimedia in our teaching. So those two sessions are meant to be paired together if you're able to make it to both. I'm the name on the right there. My name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns and I'm a teaching and learning specialist at the CTRL. And I'm going to just ask uh, my uh, collaborator to introduce herself, even though uh, she will be presenting the next session. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Catherine Stumbos. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a teaching learning specialist as well. And yeah, I'll be teaching, uh, not teaching, I'll be leading this session tomorrow. All right, so some quick guidelines for participation for this workshop. Throughout this session, we ask that you make yourself comfortable. So that might mean stimming, rocking, fidgeting, knitting, crafting, whatever that is for you. Please go ahead and utilize that. Uh, to be present in a way that works for you, there's going to be a little uh, reflection and participation throughout this session today. So we'll ask that you engage in the way that works best for you. You know yourself best and what you need. Um, ask questions and or share ideas in the chat. So please do let us know what questions you have and then share the ideas or strategies um, that have worked for you or that you're thinking about. Um, please go ahead and use the raise hand function to speak under reactions when you'd like to share something so that we can call on you. And then be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. So we are all coming in with different experiences, different backgrounds and expertise. Uh, so we're going to uh, be generous with what we know and respect what others are bringing with them. So this is a short session. So we've just got two learning outcomes. The first for today is that you will be able at the end of the session to explain how a lower reading load can support deeper student engagement and learning and how to select strategies to reduce reading load in your own classes without compromising the content or quality of what students are working on. So I'm gonna ask us to start with a warm up in the chat to start by introducing yourself. Uh, feel free to share your unit and then tell us what's one of your favorite readings to share with your students. And we're also going to ask you to think about why that is your one of your favorite readings. Uh, so keep that in mind. But what is one of your favorite readings to share with students? And it could be any class, any context, whatever it might be. So folks are just arriving. We're asking people to share in the chat, uh, introduce themselves and share what's one of your favorite readings to share with students. And if you'd like to include why that's one of your favorites, please feel free. All right, so thank you for getting us started, Craig. Um, uh, a, a short essay, um, A World Without Why. Oh, that's really interesting. If, if you'd like to share more about like, why you like that so much or what draws you back to that essay, I would love to know. Um, uh, thank you for sharing, Ashley. Um, so, uh, and then from Manu, we have the uh, a reading about the decline of American power. It can be broken down easily to explain critical reading skills. I love that. Um, Craig explains because the author's descriptions ring true for them as well. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, and Sydney, I think you're not alone. A lot of us don't love the, we may not love the readings that we feel that we have to go over with students, um, but provide supplemental ones based on their interests. That sounds wonderful. Um, these are excellent uh, suggest or like uh, contributions that we have here. 
Um, I can see some themes here of uh, readings that feel accessible or that are easy to break down, that feel relatable and familiar. Ideology and race in American history. Thank you, Evan. One off of the short list. That sounds really familiar, Robin. Um, Hannah shares one as well. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. So we wanted to think about, you know, what makes your favorite reading your favorite? Um, and so some themes that I'm pulling out here is um, things that tend to feel sort of accessible, that introduce people to some sort of concepts or norms of the field in a way that feels welcoming. Um, anything that I might be missing, Mary Catherine? Or... Right. Thank you for sharing those. So we want to keep those in mind as we move forward, because, uh, you know, what we what do we really enjoy about that reading that makes it feel necessary or central for our teaching? Um, and that can help us decide what may not be as necessary of a reading. Um, so why do we struggle with striking that the right balance? when it comes to readings. Um, we probably, uh, we may have a, a sort of question about how much is too much reading? So off the bat, I wanna point out here that there are some sort of like informal equations and, and different institutions and different units have different expectations around this, but that one credit would per class would equal two or three hours of work per student per week. So you may have heard that before or a similar version. So for every one credit that the class is worth, students would spend two or three hours working outside of the class. Um, but we wanna warn you to be careful of those equations or sort of such simple ways of deciding how much work there is to do. Um, and so why, let me ask that, why might that be? Why do we think that you know, we shouldn't just say, okay, one credit equals, you know, two hours of work per week. What comes to mind for us? Uh, uh, probably because some students might be more efficient in how they work, and so they might spend less time than prescribed. Absolutely. Beautifully said, and Mac makes the same point in the chat. Not everyone takes the same amount of time for all work. So uh, that two or three hours, right, uh, might actually take twice or three or four times as much for some students. So it's really hard for us to say, you know, what the average or median or what's the sort of range we should give students. Instead, we should think about how we can, you know, sort of limit readings to what's going to be most useful for our students. So some texts are going to be central or necessary for our course, while we're going to probably want to look at cutting others down. So how do we decide how to strike that balance. So I do want to start by asking or sort move here to asking about what are the benefits of reducing readings or why even do so in the first place. So I'm sure, right, we have a lot that we want to share with our students or that we're asked to share with our students. So why even bother <laughs> reducing readings, right? What could the benefits be? So I'd like to know what comes to mind for all of you. Why cut down readings or why try to limit the amount of readings that we assign to our students through the semester? I think Brandon gets us off with a great, starts us off with a great point to increase engagement with what's assigned, right? I think that's actually my first, yeah, <laughs> my first bullet point. Students develop a deeper understanding of the reading selected, right? Uh, and avoids on the less I assign, the more likely they are to do it. Yes, absolutely. Um, Craig, yeah, students tell me if they think the reading is too much, they just won't do it at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, and then we've already thought a little about this point of accessibility. So the first point here, right, is that less material means students can do a deeper dive. Instead of a wider range of concepts or content, they can really get to know a particular idea a lot better and focus more on the details. There's also this accessibility point that we've touched on, which is students read across a wide range of speeds. And for some students, what, you know, we might think, oh, you know, this would take me an hour to read. This would take me 20 minutes to read. will take people a lot, a lot longer. And that's just variation among humans. Some read quicker than others. And so we want to be uh, aware of that and design accessibly for that. Um, keeping in mind, some students use screen readers. They use different text-to-speech uh, programs. And so that is going to add time for them. And we want to take that time into account. 
Um, of course, we already know the students typically are balancing readings for multiple other courses. So the more precise we can make ours, the better they can focus and sort of stay, um, stay focused on the goal of that reading. And of course, this equity uh, angle here. So we've already thought a little about accessibility, um, but also thinking about how we can decentralize text as a way of sharing and recording knowledge. So, you know, if you, we have all different ways of transmitting knowledge with our students, can we think about varying up the material? So it's not just texts and readings that students are relying on for learning or engaging with content. So that does connect to Mary Catherine's session uh, on multimedia. multimedia. Um, so that is a session where we're going to explore that more, but also costs and access to text. So we want to try our best to not put any financial barriers in between students and their learning. Um, you know, they're already paying in different ways to be uh, in class. So can we reduce those in-class costs like paying for textbooks? And so less reading will often mean less prices, right? Res less money to pay for those students. Okay. And I also wanted to throw out there some of those basics of assigning readings that can help guide us towards um, deciding what we want to include and what maybe we can cut down or condense. So something to keep in mind is everything students read should be covered in class. There should be some sort of discussion, engagement, practice with what students read. Otherwise, they might get the message, well, we don't go over it in class, so why would I read it, right? So we wanna make sure that what students review in the readings is also sort of verified or practiced in class as well, or with fellow students, or um, you know, as part of a discussion, as part of an activity, so that students are practicing what they're reading and they're not just sort of reading it and then it falls out of their heads, right? We also want to clearly frame the readings that we bring to students so that they know why they're reading it and what they're reading it for. So um, we can clarify for our students every time we assign a reading, why, why are we reading it? How is it uh, helping students achieve the course goals or the learning outcomes for the course? Um, and what should they take away from the reading? After they complete it, should they be uh, ready to participate in a discussion about it? Should they be ready to talk to their peers about it? Should they be able to, um, you know, ask particular questions or fill out this, you know, worksheet. So sharing with students very clearly why they're reading what they're reading, what they're supposed to be getting from that reading, and that's going to help them focus. Um, a general sort of, uh, a, a sort of something to keep in mind is reducing load and depth towards the end of the semester. Um, it's harder to introduce new concepts or deeper concepts, certain concepts at the end of the semester, right? Students are already overloaded. They've got finals, they've got projects. So to just be cognizant of that, I'm sure we're familiar with, right? Students tend to read, <laughs> read less and read less as the semester goes on. So can we kind of keep that in mind and try and, you you know, reduce load at the very end of the semester, especially um, when students are likely to be focusing on projects and finals. And then folks already brought this up in the chat, which is excellent. Reading load should be roughly consistent. We should follow some level of routine with our students with readings. And this is something a person said to me a long time ago, and it's really stuck with me. They said, if every class you give students 15 pages of readings, and then one class you give them three times that amount, you give them 45 pages, they're not likely to read that 15 that they always do. Um, they're likely to read none of it. <laughs> so the idea, right, that someone already mentioned, one or two people already mentioned in the chat is if we kind of move outside that routine and don't talk through it or explain it with students, like why is it suddenly, you know, double or triple what we usually read, students are, are more likely to not read any of it than they are to read the amount they would typically read. So trying to follow that routine and just be transparent with students when we do change that routine, you know, um, you know, you're reading this for this purpose right? Coming back to transparency. I want to pause for questions, thoughts, concerns, strategies. All right. 
So we already talked about honoring our learning goals and being transparent. So I want to come back here um, to a sort of backwards design approach that we're talking about. So uh, as much as possible, we want to assign readings that are most necessary to satisfy our learning outcomes. The more selective we are, the better, the more of an impact those readings can have on our students. So really look at those learning outcomes that you have for the course. What do you want to achieve with students this semester? So this is that backwards design that we already thought about a little bit in the last slide, which was why, you know, what are we doing this for? What are you supposed to be getting out of this reading? So start with the goals and learning outcomes that you have. Those of you who have engaged in our uh, Course Design Institute, CDI, will be familiar with that practice of backwards design. So start with your goals and then look at the readings that fulfill or honor those goals. So, um, Right, so looking at that and also asking yourself these questions about the readings that you do have or that you're considering, including, why do I need this reading, right? Why do I need that reading and not anything else? Why do I need to have it, you know, in the syllabus? What is it providing that no other reading provides? This is something I struggle with a, a lot. I wanna give my students every reading on the topic so they can get every perspective, but I have to keep in mind right, that they might get sort of like worn out from, you know, it's the same content over and over again. Is it really helping them practice a new perspective or are we just kind of repeating the same ideas? Does it support the particular type of learning that I want in my class? Is it helping students achieve the goals that we set out for the class and the type of learning I want them to do? And when it comes to the entirety of the text, is there a purpose to assigning that entire text? Um, so am I assigning the entire text because that serves learning outcomes? Or would, uh, a, you know, just giving an excerpt or a even a paragraph, you know, is there a way to extract what's really important? Or should they read the entire text because that is helpful, that is helping honor the goals of the course? And in that case, you probably want to say to your students, here's why I'm asking you to read the entire book you know, the entire, you know, all of these chapters or whatever it might be. So again, that transparency and backwards design. All right. I want to give some examples here about strategies for reducing our readings and show you what that can look like. And then I would like us to talk about, you know, what we want to do with our own readings. So a couple strategies to think about besides just eliminating a reading, right? Maybe you still want to get part of that reading or that content to your students. You want them to practice with it before they come to class. One strategy is excerpting the reading. So pulling out the most crucial parts of the reading on which our students can focus. So some of our textbooks do this um, through the whole textbook. So they take, you know, what they feel to be the most central or important content from an essay or a book or a chapter and really highlight those sections, um, you know, in sort of anthology style for students so that they're getting what is most relevant to that, you know, to the textbook, to the discipline from that reading. So um, something I teach every semester, it's called the Scum Manifesto. Um, it's like a novella. It's really short, but I don't think students need to read the entire thing. I think I can give them, you know, a couple pages worth, and that's what they really need to get the main message, because other than that, it tends to get sort of more repetitive, and it's not introducing new information or giving more depth to it. So every, you know, when I do the scam, scam manifesto with students every semester, I excerpt it. I cut it down to shorter pieces so that students save time, and they're getting the main message of the reading more efficiently. You can also think about replacing some of your readings with other content. So video, audio, images, documentary, blogs. Again, think about what the core purpose of the reading is. So what is it doing for students? What content or skill is it exposing them to or asking them to explore? Can a different type of content 
accomplish that goal with students? Could a TED talk or a podcast or, you know, again, we're thinking about saving students time. So those are longer formats, but could something, you know, a short video perhaps supplement that work for them? Um, so, or, or uh, replace it. Um, you can look at more accessible or quicker readings if you're worried about denser sort of texts. So something I like to do is find online museum exhibits. So um, when teaching about World War II and uh, different privilege and oppression in that era, I've used the World War II online museum. And so that's a quicker read for students. It tends to be interactive, a little more visually engaging than just reading an article, right? And gets the students the same information I needed them to get from perhaps a more dry <laughs> text. Um, and again, we'd love for you to learn more and talk more about that at our session on multimedia. I wanna give uh, two examples here of uh, using readings in class with students um, in some sort of creative ways. One is annotating readings in class with students. So guiding them through a text. This is something that I do with my students is I will take uh, excerpts from the text or the text itself, but usually try to make it short, turn it into a Google doc, and ask students to annotate it in class. And then we talk about it. So this is one way, you know, turning a reading that maybe students may have felt more lost on um, or they don't feel they have the time for outside of class, bringing it into class and asking students to annotate, to make points. I ask them to highlight, underline, add their comments. And this gets students really engaged with the reading during class. And then you have a bunch of talking points from there. So that is one strategy for taking a reading out of the area of um, like outside of class, bringing it into class and making it engaging for students. Another strategy here is focusing or guiding the reading. And this is just a little excerpt from a slideshow that I use with my students. So telling students where in a longer reading to focus their attention. So maybe we assign the entire chapter, but we tell students, what should you know for next class? What should you focus on? So when assigning a reading by Lorber here, I've included guiding questions for the readings. And I say, by the time you finish this reading, you should be able to answer these two questions about the readings, the guiding questions. And so, you know, if you feel confused about that, then let's talk about it. Um, so students know what they're reading for. What are they supposed to get out of it? Again, that can help them focus when engaging. I mean, a reading of any length. They should probably be thinking about that in any length of reading, but especially with longer ones, it really helps them to give them a focus. Okay, so a last point here is about guiding students through reading. So clarifying for students how deeply they should engage with what they're reading. So I mentioned bringing in those guiding questions, but think about what are you asking students to do with the text? Skimming it, surveying it, understanding it like really deeply, analyzing it, evaluating it, arguing against it. Those are all different types of engagement. So clarifying for students what they're supposed to do with the reading in terms of you know, their interaction with it. Um, is it supposed, supposed to be a super quick read or should they spend a long time annotating it, right? Uh, is it a text with no new concepts, some new concepts, or a bunch of, you know, uh, many new concepts that they're unfamiliar with? We probably want to introduce less new concepts at the same time, try to reduce that so we don't overload our students or ourselves with all the content we have to cover. So how can we, right, keeping in mind, how much are we introducing to students? How much are they reviewing? Um, how skilled or experienced are students with these types of readings? If you are assigning mm -hmm. an, uh, a scholarly article, a um, something with a bunch of numbers in it that they have to uh, like uh, process, right? So how skilled or experienced are they and how much support do they need to interact with that type of text? And how familiar or accessible is the writing style? Is it super jargony and students might need some help with that jargon or is it going to be um, really informally written and a little quicker for them to get through? So all things to keep in mind as you make assignments and to guide students and say, okay, you should be taking a lot of notes on this or you should be highlighting or you should be you should be done with this very quickly. <laughs> you know, you should be looking for A, B, and C to answer these questions. All right. 
So to uh, keep an eye on time and just sort of get to our sharing section here, um, I want to ask you what has worked for you and then what challenges have you experienced? So have you tried to reduce your course readings? What has been helpful for you? Where have you faced challenges while doing that? Please feel free to share in the chat or over video. Um, and this is going to be sort of our uh, our wrap up for the session is to talk about these strategies with one another. So what would we like to share? We can also just talk about what questions we have or ideas we have about strategies. I was giving others some space, but I have a thought. Um, hi, everyone. Hannah Jardine, also with CTRL. Um, something I've done in my teaching, I don't know if you call it reducing readings, because we maybe still do the same amount, but distributing readings across the class. So like assigning certain readings to certain groups of students or letting students choose from a list of readings and then teach their peers about the readings. So then you might still cover the same amount of readings, but not everyone has to read everything in as much depth. And they also benefit from having to teach each other a little bit or present the material to each other. I love, I love those. Huh? And I've been trying to do the same myself, which is distribute. Um, and so like, you know, if there's like one thing per class that is more routine and consistent and it's less reading per class than, you know, three on the same day and then nothing the next day. So we're going to merge this into <laughs> our sort of closing question here because we have two minutes, um, but to say, um, you know, if you would like to share, what's a reading that you would like to sort of approach with that mindset of um, reducing or making more accessible or condensing in some way? Um, what's one that you want to um, work on to uh, support your students learning with that text a little more? We don't have any of mine. That's okay too. Mm. So Max shares um, how science works is 20 pages, but written su super accessibly. That's great. I think the 20 pages still shares them. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Mac, if that's like an early in the semester reading. So maybe there might be some hesitance to, to like assign something 20 pages at the beginning. Maybe they see the 20 you know, I, I often find myself saying to students, oh, it's only a couple pages, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as if to convince them. Um, right. But again, like making giving them framing for the reading is probably more uh, helpful than saying it's short. It's short. Right. But I love that. Get to the excerpt, excerpt the key points. Yeah, totally. Thanks, Mac. So since we're at time, I want to ask folks um, if you or let folks know if you need to move on to uh, your next uh, appointment engagement today, um, please go ahead. Lindsay has shared a an evaluation uh, form in the chat. We'd really appreciate if you filled out and give us some feedback on the session. Thank you folks for attending. We'll hang out for a few minutes for questions that you might have or ideas you want to share. 
and have a really excellent rest of your day. Thanks.